Well, good morning. It is uh, good for us to have this chance to be together. We'll look forward to it each and every Lord's Day. And uh, appreciate so very much the opportunity to be uh, just be the, uh, the preacher here. It's been a blessing in our lives, and we just hope and pray that we are able to be a blessing to you all as well. Well, today, if you take your Bibles or the pew there in front of you, or and you can look to Job chapter 1. Today and next Sunday, we're going to be looking at the first two chapters of Job, at God's guidance for us during times in our lives when things go wrong. Back in August of 2001, 293 people were boarding a, a, a Canadian Air Transit flight from Toronto to Lisbon, Portugal. And about midway over the Atlantic Ocean, more than a thousand miles from Portugal, Captain Robert Pache and his crew noticed there was a fuel leak. 23 minutes later, he issues an emergency distress signal. 40 minutes later, the right engine has lost power. Two minutes later, the left engine loses power. Still, more than a thousand miles away from a Portugal airport, without power, they are helpless. And as the plane dropped through the sky from over 30,000 feet, the, and it started to depressurize, it started shaking and jerking violently, and passengers panicked and screamed, and the flight crew was hysterical. Captain Pache, with only minimum power, a control stick, and an emergency propeller, for 18 minutes he wrestled that jetliner, guiding it down to one of the island of the Azores, there was an airport, and he was able to land the plane, but he hit with such force that the tires exploded and burst in the flames. Luckily, there was no fuel on the plane to cause any other fire, but one of the passengers said, it was a miracle that we survived. Now, there are times in our lives when we feel like, just like that, maybe not at 30,000 feet and then we're dropping out of the air, but maybe we'll feel more like people in that airplane, in that fuselage, the tightness of that cylinder that we just can't escape the helplessness of our circumstances that are around us. And we're being carried along to a destination that we don't want to go. You know, we're, we're faced with all sorts of things. We might be faced with a terminal illness. Someone we love is dying or has died. We lose a job. We're in a, an unfair situation or circumstances we never ever deserved or desired. Our marriage might be coming apart or there is tension within our family. There are unspoken hostilities, heavy emotion that just, just threatens to just tear us apart. We all know of people who could describe firsthand those very situations in their lives and hardships and what it's like. And they could go on and they could add on to that list many, many other things. But there is, is something that uh, when it's very natural for us to ask, it, there is something for us sometimes to ask why. Why? Why? Why is this happening? Where is God in all of this? Why doesn't he answer my prayers? Why doesn't he just step in and do something? The book of Job, in part, is given to us by God to help us answer these questions. And they may not answer the questions that we want, and they may not answer them in the way that we want to hear. It may be actually even hard to hear, but this profound book touches on these deep themes more than any other book in the Bible, and they give us guidance that we need. Job 1.1 is for us the introduction to the, the character, the main character of the book. It says, there was a man in the land of us whose name was Job that that a man 
was blameless, upright, fearing God, and turning away from evil. Lord Byron, I think, was, was right on target when uh, he said, Truth is always strange, stranger than fiction. Job was a real living person. He was a real living person. He lived in the land of Uz, which was east of Canaan, probably about the time of Abraham. He was probably a very important person, well-known citizen of the land. Job was mentioned in Ezekiel chapter 14 and verses 14 and also in verse 20 where he's there mentioned as one of the great men of the Old Testament along with Noah and Daniel. In the New Testament, James would tell us in chapter 5 that he is an example of endurance and, and compassion. Job, you see, was blameless and upright. He was blameless and upright. Job sinned, but he also knew how to handle sin, to turn from evil, to admit and to confess his sin, to allow God to deal with it so that he was living uprightly, rightly before God. And Job feared God. He had the utmost respect for God. He, he understood God's power. He understood God's working in his life. Job was a man like us who was trying to live a life of obedience and reverence to God. Verse 2 says that seven sons, he had seven sons and three daughters, and he had a lot of possessions, 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 oxen, 500 female donkeys. We see the second thing about him was that he was a man of wealth. Job was very, very wealthy. Verse 3 says that his sons used to go and hold a feast in the house of each other on his day. I don't know if that was his birthday, his day meant, if that was their anniversary or what that day was, but they would bring the family. All of those sons and daughters would come together and they would spend time eating and drinking uh, and in festivities together. And when the days of feasting had completed their cycle, Job would then send and consecrate them, rising up early in the morning, offering burnt offerings according to the numbers of all of them. For Job said, maybe, perhaps my sons have sinned and have cursed God in their hearts. And so Job thus would do this continually. The third thing here we learn about Job is that he was a man, a father who loved his children. He had this fatherly love. Job prays for his children. A prayer that echoes by every Christian parent whose heart has been burdened. You know, when our girls were small, we used to have a prayer that was on our refrigerator that said, Be their father in the moments of decision when two paths present themselves to our children, especially during that time when they are beyond our direct influence. Send others who will help them do what is righteous and just. And that was what Job was doing. Job was praying for and, and, and was concerned about his children. We know that every day that we send our kids out into the world, we're sending them into a world that they are being bombarded by constant pressures to, to just turn away from God. And as a father, Job just, just poured out his heart before God, and he offers these burnt offerings, which were offerings given to show uh, dedication, consecration to God. Basically, what Job is telling God, he's saying, my children are yours, Lord. May they be totally under your control. Keep them in your hands, and don't let them go. That's how Job was introduced to us. He's a godly man. He's a, a wealthy man. He's a father who loves his children deeply. In verse 6, the scene kind of changes. And we go from the scene of dealing and introducing Job, we go to, to heaven. And, and while we are being introduced to Job, it, it's like the set of actors has, is, is there. And now the props are all taken away and the backdrop has been lifted up. And God allows us to see behind the scenes to the invisible spiritual realm 
that's around us. The realm of God and Satan and, and, and the realm of angels and demons. Verse 6 says that now there was a day when the sons of the God, the angels, came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan also came along with them. And the Lord said to Satan, from where did you come? And Satan said to the Lord, from roaming about the earth and walking on it. And the Lord said to Satan, well, have you considered my servant Job? For there's no one like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, fearing God and turning away from evil. Then Satan answered the Lord, well, does Job fear God for nothing? I mean, have you not made a hedge about him and his house and all that he has on every side? You've blessed the work of his hands. His possessions have increased in the land. But put forth your hand now and, and, and touch all that he has. He'll surely curse you to your face. Then the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your power. Only don't put forth your hand on him. And so Satan departed from the presence of the Lord. Now let's pause here for a second and understand what's happening. Because when we read passages like this, it's really hard to visualize the, the whole scene. All of the scope of all that's happening and what's happening here. Imagine, if you can, the universe, the planet after planet, and, and, and the solar system after solar system, and galaxy beyond galaxy. It is impossible for us to, to just totally grasp the vastness. And here is God in his throne room. And from all over this vastness, the sons of God, thousands and thousands, countless numbers of angels have gathered into this vast throne room in the very presence of God to report on their activities. And as vast as creation is, God is in control of it all. When we start thinking of, of God being in control and we think of our creation, we just think of our little world. We think of our little life. We think of our little town. We think of our little church. But it's a whole lot bigger than that. Bigger than we can even wrap our minds around. And as vast as creation is, God is in control. All of creation is accountable to him. Nothing takes God by surprise. Nothing goes beyond the authority of his word or his will. And this is hard to understand. Satan, fallen, rebellious, the devil. God allows, he permits Satan to come into his presence. And thanks to John Milton's Paradise Lost, many people have this mistaken idea that Satan is ruling the world from hell. You know, better to reign in hell than to serve in heaven. But Satan will not be cast into the lake of fire until the final judgment. Today, he's free to go about the earth and even into God's presence in heaven. And I want you to notice a couple of things. I want you to notice three important truths here. And the first is, Satan is not equal to God. Do not ever forget that. You know, I was a, have been, was a big fan of General... Storm and Norman Schwarzkopf. I enjoyed reading his book. I, I just, there's something about him. He was kind of a, a modern day Patton for me, I guess. You know what I mean? He didn't take any guff and he loved to give it. <laughs> and that was, that was General Schwarzkopf, you know? But can you imagine in the Persian Gulf, and, and can you imagine Saddam Hussein coming up to, to General Schwarzkopf and saying, hey, General Schwarzkopf, uh, I'd like permission if I could to bomb Kuwait. And then I want to destroy your army, and I'd like permission to wipe everything out under your command. What kind of answer do you think Storm and Norman Schwarzkopf would give and would come back with? What, type, what kind of answer did he come back with? No enemy ever comes and asks for permission to attack. That's just not the way it works. And yet Satan has asked God for permission to attack Job. Now, this is not warfare between equal opposing sides. This is not warfare between good and evil, the good God and the bad God. Job is not a casualty of war between God and Satan. This is a test of Job's faith allowed by Almighty God. And Satan makes it happen 
but God permits it. He allows it. There's a second truth I think we need to notice. Beside the fact that Satan is not equal to God, we need to notice how he operates. God says, where have you been? And Satan goes, well, I've been roaming around the earth. Peter tells us in 1 Peter 5, 8, that your adversary, Satan, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Behind the scenes of life is Satan. He is searching. He is looking for people that he can go get. People that he can try to, to place under his power. People he can try to ruin their lives. People he can try to destroy. He is a malicious enemy. He's looking for opportunity to lead people away from God and lead people to destruction. That is the way he operates. But there is a third thing. And we need to see here that Satan's power, that God places limits on Satan's power to affect our lives. God says, have you seen my servant Job? There's no one like him on all the earth. Blameless. He, he, he turns from evil. Have you tested his faith in me? I say, just sure. I've seen him, but you know, I can't get to him because you're protecting him. So God says, okay, he's in your power, but just don't touch his body. It's God who points out Job to Satan. And as a subject here for Satan to attack, this test of Job's trust and relationship with God, this is what this is all, this is a test here. And it is God who sets the conditions for the test. God sets the boundaries. God sets the limitation and is rebellious and as malicious as Satan is, he never, ever even attempts to go beyond what God allows. He can't. He has no power to. I think it's important for us to understand that. That while, while we think about the trials and the experiences and the hardships that we go through in our lives, first, there are dimensions in those trials that we do not see. And secondly, God is unquestionably in control over what happens. Look at verse 13. And this is the description of what Satan does to Job. Because here it tells how the sons and daughters were getting together uh, and, and all of that and at the brother's house. And then a messenger came and, and says, well, the, you know, the ox were plowing and the donkeys were feeding and the Sabians came and attacked. And, and they were all destroyed. And I just escaped to come and tell you. And while he was still speaking, yet another one comes and tells about fire coming down from heaven and it burns up the sheep and consumes them and the shepherds. And then he's telling that and another one comes along and says, hey, while the Chaldeans formed three bands and they raided the camels and they took them away and they slew the animals and the edge of the sword and I alone, I alone escaped to tell you. And then while he's doing that, another comes and says, your sons and your daughters were eating and having one of their feasts, and the winds from the four corners of the earth come, and it just knocks the house down upon them and kills them all. Satan goes to the very boundaries of what God allowed him. Think about this, the utter devastation here. It's complete, and Job has no time to absorb it. Because it's boom, 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 one right after another, all within a day. Everything was taken from Job. Everything. And if, if we are ever tempted, if we're ever tempted to think that our circumstances are just too much to bear, we would do well to go back and reread Job chapter 1. Because it is impossible to understand how utterly broken Job has been. And what's Job's response in verse 20? Job arose, he tore his robe, he shaved his head, gestures of deepest grief, and he fell to the ground and worshipped. How did Job respond to this unimaginable tragedy in his life? Well, he didn't blame God. He responded to this test by worshipping God. Verse 21, Job says, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And through all of this, 
Job did not sin, nor did he blame God. Now, as I have been thinking through this passage and how it applies to our lives, I'd like us to to think about a, a couple of things. There's three thoughts that I would like us to consider. And first is, I believe, it's crucial that we understand. And that is God's authority over what we have in life. We got to understand God has authority over what we have in life. Otis Moss was from Cleveland, Ohio. And he was preaching the funeral of Mrs. Martin Luther King Sr., which was Martin Luther King Jr.'s mother. And Mr. Moss was the preacher that did that service. And he preached a very powerful gospel message. But he preached on the little dash in between. He pointed out that on her tombstone there was her date of birth and there was going to be her date of death. And he didn't talk about her date of birth and he didn't talk about her date of death. He talked about the dash in between. Those are the things that made up her life. Those were the things that described her life. And that's what Job is talking about here. He said, naked in birth, naked in death, and everything in between. The dash, he said, belongs to God. And then Job prays, thank you, Lord, God, for for the times that I've had all these things, for the blessings and the enjoyment that they have brought my life through them. Rather than complain about the loss, I recognize your sovereign right to do with me and all that you have blessed me with and to do as you will. See, life is not about whether or not we own real estate. Life is not about how large our our house is. Life is not about our family and and how big our family is and whether or not we have a lot of children or we have a lot of grandchildren. We, it, it's not about the size of our portfolio. It's not about our retirement nest egg. Life is about glorifying God. Living in the dash. Living in the dash. Remaining faithful in our relationship to him. In riches and in poverty. In whatever He sovereignly chooses to bless us with or to withhold from our lives. There's a second thought, and that is God knows what we're going through. God knows what we're going through. You know, there are times when we wonder just how far God is going to allow Satan to go. We wonder that. We reach our limits and we wonder, where is God? And and, and from the outset, the writer reminds us that no matter what happens in this world, in our lives, God is the one who's on the throne and has everything under his control. Satan's the one prowling around. And if Satan had not restrained and was not, were, were not restrained by God, any one of us could find ourselves in the very circumstances that Job experienced. But God's protecting his hand, and it's been on us. It's been on us. We know how it's been upon us. As Chris started our service off telling us about how we've been protected thus far from the coronavirus. We have been. And if you don't feel like you've ever been protected by the hand of God and had a hedge, think about where you were born. You live in the United States of America. And only one that I know of is here that was not born in the United States, but is an American. How blessed are we? How blessed are we? But see, not everybody has that blessing, do they? We not only live in America, we live in southwest Missouri. That affords us so many things that a lot of people don't ever understand and and can't even comprehend. And if we have any amount of peace or joy in our life, it's because of God's protection and the limiting of Satan. God puts limits on what Satan did to Job. God puts a hedge of protection around our lives as well. You know, the Apostle Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, that that God is faithful. He will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able, but with the temptation provide the way of escape also that you may be able to endure it. God knows what we can bear. 
and he will never he will never allow you to be tested so that your trust in him will be destroyed he'll never allow it to go that far that's a promise that we can hold on to that when Satan wounds us, when Satan hurts us, when Satan tempts us and tries to turn us away from God, we need to praise God for his graciousness towards us, even in the worst of circumstances, and, and keep trusting him. Because then it is an opportunity for us to find just how much God really loves and cares for his people. The third thought. What goes on behind the scenes of, of, your, of your life? Job knew what happened. You know what? Job didn't know why. And that's the heart of the matter. Because the author allows you and I to visit the very throne room of heaven to hear God and Satan speak, we know who caused the destruction. We know why he was allowed to cause it. But if we didn't have that insight, if we didn't have that look or opportunity, we would probably respond and take the very same approach that Job's friends took and blame Job for the tragedy and try to encourage him to curse God and die. We've got to remember that the experiences of our testing goes way beyond the the physical earthly things that we're trying to hold on to and the circumstances that we're trying to understand. Through all of these things, God is working his perfect will. He, he's working to bring us to salvation. He's working to bring us to spiritual maturity. He's working to bring all mankind into a, a saving relation, deepened relationship with him. This side of eternity we may never know what God is doing. And yet in all these things, he is giving us a very opportunity. He's given us an opportunity to serve him. He's given us an opportunity to trust him. He's given us an opportunity to glorify him. Now how or, or what do we do? What shall we do? What should we do? Well, we need to do a couple of things. And first, we need to do what Job did, and we need to look back. We need to look back to his birth. He said, naked I came out of my mother's womb. Everything Job owned was given to him by God. Everything Job had was given him. And the same God who, who gave it had the right to take it away. Job simply acknowledged that I am just your steward, Lord. I'm a steward of what you have blessed me with. And so we need to do the very same thing. Secondly, like Job, we need to look ahead. Job looked ahead to his death. He said, naked I came, you know, from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return. Now, not his mother's womb. That's not where he's talking about going, because that would be impossible. But he said he would be buried and returned to dust. Nothing that that he acquired between birth and death would go with him to the next world. And that's what we read at the beginning of, uh, of the, the service this morning here in 1 Timothy 6, 7. We brought nothing in this world, and it's for certain that we can take nothing out. You will never see a hearse pull a U-Haul. You don't take anything with you. And finally, the third thing here is that Job looked up, and we need to look up as well. And utter that magnificent statement of faith. That the Lord gave and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Instead of cursing God, as Satan said Job would do, Job blessed the Lord. And anyone can say, you know, that the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. People can do that all day long, but... It really takes faith to, in the middle of our sorrow, in the middle of our grief, in the middle of our suffering, to say, blessed be the name of the Lord. There's a question before every one of us this morning. And will we pass the test? Remaining faithful to our relationship with the Lord so that we glorify him 
Like Job, the only way to pass is to daily put ourselves into God's sovereign, loving hands. See, the reason that Job didn't stay in mourning, the reason that Job didn't stay in, in, and he didn't have a pity party for himself, it was because he got up and he worshiped. He praised the Lord. And that was because he knew that God was in control. He didn't ask, why, Lord? Where are you, God? He just praised the Lord. And too often in our individual lives and that of our own families and our own churches and even as a country in our time of division and, and discontent and worry that so many people have right now, and we question God, we say, why? How, how come? Where are you, Lord? It's our time in sorrow and in suffering. We need to praise God. Trials, suffering, sorrow, they're opportunities for us to praise the Lord, not to have pity parties. Look at church history. As we mentioned in Sunday school, you know, the church always does its best work when we're in a minority. We, we're, the church has always been under attack. It's always been under attack. And I, you know, and, it, and it, it's easy to get down. I understand that. It is easy for us to get down and discouraged, especially when we see activist judges ruling in, in ways from the bench that totally goes against the Constitution and totally goes against God's word. It'd be easy to stay depressed. But depression comes when we take our eyes off the Lord. And Christians, we do our best work, not from positions of power, but when we are faithful, when we are obedient and obey our sovereign Lord who is in control, and that's when we can see that we have, people can see that we have been with Jesus. When we do just that. Like Job, now is our time to praise the Lord. This morning, if anyone's here today who's never made Jesus the Lord and master of their life, we want to give you that opportunity to do just that. A chance to, to just publicly repent of your sin and confess Jesus as Lord. To be buried with him in that water grave of Christian baptism and rise to walk in newness of life. We want to give you an opportunity to respond to Jesus today. Jesus, I come. If there's a need today, we invite you to share that with us. Won't you just stand as we sing this song? no way do I want anyone to think that with the trials and tribulations and the hardships that many of you have gone through and lived through in your life that we're anywhere putting any damper on that, the reality of those things. 
I want to say thank you for the example that you have been in showing so many here as well as those you come in contact with that God is in control and he is faithful and you are praising the Lord through those times. And so thank you for that. Don't forget the announcements in the bulletin. Read those at your leisure and keep them very much before you. And also just remember Bible study uh, Wednesday morning at 930. Great and exciting study. So let's conclude by just going to the Lord in prayer. Father God, I thank you for allowing us the privilege and honor to be in your presence this day, Father. We just are so glad that we could come into your throne room, Father, and to look through your word and to find instruction and encouragement that will help us in this time that's so trying in our world right now. That we can see all of the, the struggles that are going on, but Father, we have hope because we have Jesus. We have hope because you are in control. Thank you, Lord, for loving us. Thank you for allowing us this privilege to just be together this day in worship and being able to gather around your table of love and memory. For it's in Jesus' precious name that we pray. Amen. Have a great day.